error begins and, and can come in any time that we are more concentrated on either somebody who is the, the source giver, the, the one who, who God is going through, and they're trying to teach you a truth, and you're like, I don't know if I emotionally like what they're saying or if I emotionally like that person. So I don't know if I'm even going to bother listening. That begins error. Absolute truth is a truth that really should be based on unchangeable facts that pretty much everybody agrees on. That would kind of be the the kind of working definition of absolute truth. And in case you wondered, all of this falls under philosophy. So if you're really interested, you'll want to find a good philosophy person to talk with. But this concept is one that says essentially this. We agree, and it's universally true, and it not, it's not changeable, that a circle which is round is a circle always. Whether it's small, whether it's big, a round object is a circle, right? We also believe that a square is never round as long as it's square, even if it might maybe have rounded corners or, you know, not be exactly a square, we would still basically call it a square. This is for those of us who, if you've ever needed to draw this for somebody, well, you know, it's kind of rounded like this, and some of us cannot draw a round circle to save our lives. And some of us, if we're going to draw a square, we just kind of sloppily do it, and other people are like, well, that's not really a square. It's more like a trapezoid or a a rectangle or something. And you're like, no, I told you it was a square. We believe it's a square. Don't be technical on me, right? But they're universal and they're timeless. No one ever calls round circular objects a square. No one ever calls a square a round circular object, and it is never going to change. Now, maybe you would do that, but people would call you crazy. Mathematics is another example. It's an absolute truth. If you add two things with two more things, you'll always have four things. No matter how many kind of brain teasers or whatever try to make it into something else, that is always going to be the truth. No matter what, it's been the truth for as long as there have been mathematics, and it will be the truth for as long as there are mathematics, nothing else changes. So as long as you do it correctly, even if you do it differently than somebody else might, mathematics has to come up with the exact same outcome. It is an absolute truth. Now there's a lot of different kinds of truth, but the other one I want to talk about today is relative truth. Because relative truth is an interpretation of facts based on your experience. In a sense, this is now taking facts in the way we take them in and sort of running them through our own experiences, our our own um, opinions and circumstances and cultures, and saying, now this is true. So what is true today and in this context may not be true 50 years from now in another one. That would just be reality. And so in a sense, what happens with this is that we sort of determine how square a square needs to be to be called a square or how circular a circle needs to be to be called a circle. It's not necessarily absolute. It's sort of a different thing. Now, if you wanted a whole lot of really great concepts of this, one of them would be If you have a square, but it has a rounded edge where the points are, is it still a square? I would tell you it's an absolute truth in my book, but other people would say, no, if it's not exactly perfect, it is not what you say it is. So this becomes important. There are things where we may rightfully disagree, and I've got to tell you that one of those things ends up being in things that we should not talk about if we're not willing to hear other people's opinions. 
This is the problem with where we find ourselves once in a while. And by the way, if you've never heard the phrase before, I want to teach you a new one. Now, now humor me for a minute. All right? If you don't humor me for a minute, I'm going to take 10. You ever heard the phrase postmodernism? Or the word, the term postmodernism? There's a lot of people in philosophical circles that are saying we are now living in what is known as the postmodern world. Postmodern world essentially has done away with absolute truths. The idea essentially is that now every truth is sort of a, an objective, it's what you decide is truth, even if it's supposed to be an absolute truth. This becomes a little bit challenging even for postmodernists when it comes to some things which are always going to be true. But by the way, it's one of the reasons why you can hear two people say completely opposite things and you'll hear a whole bunch of people saying that one or the other was lying. And really, if you want to know the truth, they're probably both lying. It's the reality of it. One of the issues is that truth cannot be left up to my opinion. And by the way, part of that is really, it's about our feelings. Right? So right now, I would say that an absolute truth is that pretty much all of you are sitting down in a chair. This is a chair. It's a padded chair. It is a kind of rose sort of colored chair. We could kind of get into whether or not that's truth or not. See? But you are sitting in a chair. You are capable of sitting because of the way your body bends, but also because of something called gravity. Gravity is created. Now, I'm going into a whole bunch of things here. I told you I was going to need a minute. Gravity is controlled by a whole bunch of things, but scientists primarily say gravity is the result of our Earth, which is round, spinning. Now, if you truly want to be a postmodern person, and you may have seen this already, the people who believe the world is flat. Now, I would tell you, if you believe the world is flat, okay, Okay, you're a good postmodernist. There are objective truths. They will tell you, here's all the evidence. We're being lied to. I'm like, look, they went into space. That's a lie too. No, no, they went into space. They've sent things into space. They've taken pictures. It's most definitely round. You see, this is the idea that you would fight over something that's objectively not true. This is the problem that we're facing. Now, I'm going somewhere with this, I I promise. And here's one of the things I want to make sure we understand. The consequences of postmodernism or the consequences of us beginning to believe that every truth is, is based on our own emotions, our own opinions, our own feelings, is essentially that we get to a point where we do not trust one another to provide basic information. Everything is questioned. The, the blurring between what is fact and, and fiction makes it impossible to know what you're truly seeing. To get basic information out it is not really a good thing in at all. Now, I, I want to be kind of real here because I, I, I've got to tell you that everything I'm going to say today that I'm hoping I'll preach and will, you will receive as God's word and, and truth from above, there are people who would tell you It's untrue. That it is not good information because of nothing else but how they feel. How they feel or what their opinion is about me or about my God or about anything else. So I would tell you, I feel like I am standing and it is my opinion that I am standing on centuries and, and millennials, millenniums of truth and that I speak, uh, hopefully a God who has been the creator of the universe is speaking through me and not this is just me giving you my lovely opinion based on 
What could or could not be facts? All right? I want you to have that in your mind as we get going. Because my question today is when do we best find our true vocation as image bearers of God? Now, if you don't fully understand the question I'm asking, is that our job, as God created us to be, is to be the image bearers of God in the world that he created. That's our job. That's what we are supposed to do. And the question is, do we actually accomplish this? You see, we've been talking about opposites. We talked about the beginning and the end. Both things are in God's hands. Order and chaos. God takes the chaos and brings order to it. Light and darkness. God is in the light and is always going to be in the light. We need to make sure that we're in the light. And today I want to talk a little bit about truth and error. And I want to give you some truth to begin with. Genesis 1.27 now, you probably are familiar with this verse. So God created mankind in his own image. In the image of God, he created them. Male and female, he created them. That is really quite simply the way that we see it. It is done. It is complete. God has done it. He talks about he's going to do it, and then he does it. Now, the image of something is a reflection of what that original object is. So let me give you an example of this. Let's pretend that this is not actually church, but art class, okay? For just a moment, you're going to pretend that I'm an artist. Now, I'm not, and I'm not anywhere near an artist. There's some kids in my family that, that can really, frankly, blow me away, but that's not what it is. So let's say I took a bowl of fruit. I don't care. You can imagine any kind of bowl of fruit you want. It doesn't matter to me, all right? And I put it on a stand under the lights, and, and, and I put it right here, and I have my canvas, and you have your canvases and all of your paints and everything else, and we are going to together paint this bowl of fruit. So I would start drawing wherever I would start drawing. Again, I'm not an artist, but, you know, begin to, to do the process and choosing colors and doing all of these different things and shading things and whatever else. And when we were all finished, if there are 50 people in this room, we would have 50 images or 50 reflections of the bowl of fruit that I had placed here. So one, if somebody would walk into the back door, have no idea that they just walked into this fake art class that I suddenly created up here on the platform that you all have been a part of this whole time, they would come in and go, oh, look, they've been painting the fruit bowl up front, right? But then there would also be a reflection of you as an artist. So if you particularly love bananas, and there's a banana in the fruit basket, you might make that banana a little slightly brighter or, or a little bigger or a little more prominent as you draw. Some of you who are very talented might get down to the nitty-gritty details and, and, and then have the shading just perfect so that when you're looking at your picture, it looks almost real as though you are looking at the bowl of fruit. Somebody might see your picture, and if not for the fact that it's not 3D, think that they're getting hungry and would love to have one of those bananas. Others of us who kind of go, hmm, I just need to draw something that looks like a banana. I might just have a yellow squiggly mark there. Right? And that's a part of a reflection of who we are too, right? And I'm not going to get too much into who you are, but there would be some who would get halfway through and be like, this one's bad, and break it over something and wish to start over. Right? And then based on how sometimes I've noticed things go during church. Some people spend their whole church service getting up and going to the bathroom. And I'm not talking about the old people, but that's all right. I just want to... <laughs> you see, the, the reality is we will put a reflection of us into that, but what we're creating is a reflection of what was placed here. If I were to, after we all painted, come bring a whole bunch of fruit bowls, all different, people would come in and go, oh, it's the one right there. It's the third one from the left. Because they would see the image of what you're doing. I think that's important for us to pay attention to. 
Now, I want to also be very clear that the, the idea that humanity is created in God's image isn't suggesting that God is in the form of a human. If God was just a, a, a body that looks like us, then there's one key issue theologically that is going to get in the way of that. Do you know what it is? When Jesus comes, he would not need to take the form of a man. He would already be in the form of a man. Think about it for a minute. We don't know exactly what Jesus is, or what God is trying to say here, other than to say that we are reflections of who he is. That is the key thing I want you to walk away here in just a minute with. But what the image most certainly is, is the ability to relate to God. So God creates us with the ability to be speaking to him, to be, to be relating with him, to, to be able to talk with him and walk with him and, and follow his directions and have fun and, and all the great things that you would do, right? Okay, I don't know. Some of you are kind of like looking at me like, okay, whatever. You see, humanity is a spiritual species. We are able to relate to God. i got to tell you something. Have you ever seen the pictures that people used to email around or they're on Facebook or the videos where the dog is praying? It's not. It has no ability, as far as we can tell, to have a a talk with God. and, And it doesn't have saving or sin or anything else like that. It's a dog. We love our dogs. I get it but it's an animal that doesn't relate to God. The other thing this image certainly is is to reflect a a capacity that we can behave like God can more so than any other creature that God created. God created all of the creatures, but he only created a few that seem to be able to show reason and to be able to show wisdom. Now, some of us do that better than others. Some of us are a little more wise than others, but God is able to show wisdom. God is able to show reason. He's able to have a full range of emotions, and he's able to love unconditionally. It doesn't matter what you've done. It doesn't matter how far away you think you are from him. He can show you his emotions and how much he really cares for you. God shows his imagination and creativity. If you don't believe that, look up what an anteater looks like. Or a platypus. Or that one cousin in your... Never mind. (laughs) You see, God has this incredible imagination, and he gave it to us. I really, I don't see a lot of the animals. I've never been walking by a squirrel who was trying to create a piece of art. It just doesn't happen. But you and I do. You see, as image bearers, this is a key part of the image of what creates, what separates us from the rest of the created animals. The rest of the ways that God filled the earth with plants, and plants don't make art in a, in a, in a way that we would think of art. They grow a flower, maybe, or they look really pretty, maybe, but they just do what they know how to do. We're like, hey, wouldn't it be fun if we could fly? What can we do these days? We can fly, right? This is the, 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 the idea of we are above and beyond. Humanity is the crown. It's the great achievement. It's above all else in creation. And by the way, we are intended to be God's representative to all creation. You see, all creation should benefit from humankind's existence and obedience to God. Now, the Bible tells us that we get to have dominion over all the other created things, and and God will bring Adam all of the different animals and tell him to name them and and so forth and so on. But, But dominion truly is this idea of stewardship. Having dominion over something doesn't mean that you own it. It means that you have stewardship over it. You're to take care of it. It is not for us to just decide what we want to do. It's for us to take care of God's creation. Now, I could go for a long time on that, but I'm going to kind of back off on it a little bit. 
You see, there's this nuance in the Hebrew here. The idea that humanity is the pinnacle creature is actually in the scripture passage. It's in the original word used for Hebrew. He's basically saying, after everything else that was good and everything else that was wonderful and everything else that was really, really cool, God said, now let me show you what I can do. I'm going to make something that is a reflection of who I am. This is the, the greatest thing ever. This is, this is the best And so Adam becomes a caretaker, a steward, a partner, really, with God in order to take care of good creation. So we need to be taking care of the creation we're given with respect. You know, we, gotta, we, we should be paying close attention. You want to get into what is a relative truth and what is an absolute truth? How we take care of animals is one of the areas where you'll see people really fight this out. How we take care of the earth. Whether or not there are certain dangers to the earth, those are all things that there, there's fights going on that are more of a relative nature than an actual absolute. Now I want to point something out. The creation of mankind as the image bearers of God is of the utmost importance. And if you didn't catch it, one of the things that God is trying to make a point here is that you, as an individual, are not what he's intending for you to be. There is you as a unity. That we as mankind are supposed to be the reflection of God. Not just me, not just you, not just the person sitting on the right or on the left or in front or behind you, but all of us. So, as we read through the verse, you might have noticed, God made mankind in his own image. Mankind being singular, he made like a man, kind of in his own image. Then God made mankind, which is considered them, plural, in the image of God. One of the things that happens there is it's used twice in God's own image and in the image of God. Now they've changed the language because we don't talk like that, but it's meant to really make it clear. And then finally, both male and female, he created them both in his image. They are united. You have these three movements here. God created mankind in his image. God made mankind, them, in the image of God. And male and female, he created them. Both are him, his image. I think that's really important for us to understand. This is absolute truth. This isn't just something that I'm giving you an opinion on, although there are people that would argue with me on that, and it's all right for them to be wrong. I will smile and politely listen to what they say and ask them if they also believe the world is flat. <laughs> but God created us. God is the one who did it. He says so in his word. Now you can say, well, how could that possibly be true? All right, go find me some other writings that have existed through the course of time that are so widely followed because there's this faith aspect to what we're talking about. You won't find it, but go for it. Postmodernism is going to ask you to deny this, but does denying something or not liking something make it any less true? We have to be careful about this. And here's where the problem comes in. We have the truth. God created humanity. God created mankind. He made them in his image, and he made them both male and female. That's absolute 100% truth. And then you get the introduction of error. Are you ready? We only have to turn a couple of chapters. Now the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals the Lord God had made. He said to the woman, Did God really say you must not eat from any tree in the garden? Now you probably know the rest of the story. I'm not going to talk too much about that because it's really not important. Because the serpent is a created being that introduces error to the garden. That's what I want you to see. Now a lot of times people go, oh, this was Satan, this was whatever else. If you're reading the passage, it never says that. In fact, what it said was the serpent was more crafty than any of the wild animals that the Lord God had made. 
I want you to get this right and make sure you're, you're hearing what I'm saying because it brings a lot of questions, right? More crafty, more cunning, more, more whatever. But the first question that I've always wanted to ask at this is why does it speak? When it speaks to the woman, she doesn't even act like it's weird. The next verse doesn't say, and Eve screamed and ran the other way because she'd never been spoken to by a serpent before. Apparently, she thinks this is normal. And the scripture tells us a couple verses later, for those of you that have ever wondered, that Adam was there the whole time. He doesn't go, Eve, stop listening to that serpent. It shouldn't even be talking. Whatever pizza God gave us last night, it wasn't quite right. Or stay away from those mushrooms next time. This is just a reality, right? They're not even phased by it. I got to tell you, first off, we would see the snake and go, ah, a snake. If it began to speak, there'd be nobody left to, to sit around and talk to it. I can promise you that. We'd be out the door. It can have the building. How do you get rid of a talking snake? Burn the building down. I think our insurance would cover it. Who are you going to call an exterminator? I have a talking snake in my sanctuary. Will you come get it? They don't even care. Did God create this particular creature with the ability to reason? To talk? We recognize that we have the choice of whether or not to love God back. Did this creature have that same choice? These are, are questions that are really important. Uh, this, this idea of Satan coming into the creature comes later in Scripture, and, and perhaps it's true, but the, the reality is, is that it's, it's evil no matter how you want to look at it. And by the way, serpents debate, or scholars debate, whether serpents are, are snakes, like we think of snakes, or something else. In fact, I read something that said one of, a, one of the uh, uh, commentators about 100 years ago said, actually, I think what a serpent probably was was something more like an orangutan, when you read the description. And uh, uh, does it matter? Whatever it is, it shouldn't be talking. Whatever it is, what it says is not true. You see, the creature bringing error is portrayed as crafty, shrewd, or cunning, and sometimes we will use those similar words in kind of a, of a, a positive thing, right? Someone's really good at something, and, and the Bible even tells us sometimes you need to be shrewd. But here it's clearly a negative thing. This is, this is not the kind of cunning or shrewd or or craftiness that is an admirable trait. This is all negative. I think it's important that we get this. The error is a lie in and of itself because it's brought to light with what scholars are saying in the, in the original Hebrew is a faked surprise. Now we read it all as a question. Did God really say that you couldn't eat of any tree in the garden? Scholars say that most likely the way this should have been read or should have been written is really that God would say that you could not eat of any of the trees of the garden. Like a surprise. Like really, you chose today to come to church. Was it for the free food that we have? Don't get excited, we don't have any, but... Right? He's lying. He's faking surprise. He's, he's lying outright because he says that God said to them that they could not eat from any of the trees. That's not what God said at all. In fact, it's the opposite of what God said. 
God said, you can eat of any of these trees. Any of them. But don't touch this one. Because if you do, you will certainly die. There's a big difference there. It's important that we understand this. The serpent is suggesting with a lie that God might not have said what God said, but at the same time, he's essentially assassinating God's character by sowing this almost disbelief into Adam and Eve that essentially what's going on in their life is that they are being tricked by God that that if they would truly just have privilege of any of the trees, then they would be able to do anything they want just like God could. The serpent ultimately lies about that too. He says, oh, she, says, she tells him, hey, you know, God told us not to eat that one or we'll die. And the serpent goes, yeah, you won't die. Hmm. She takes a bite and goes, hmm, I didn't die, did I? God never said it was going to happen immediately. You see, part of what the serpent is doing is he's trying to make it seem like the freedom that they actually had, which was to eat of any of the trees, it was a lack of freedom. It's like if I were to, you know, get a whole bunch of juicy steak dinners right before we finished church. I haven't brought in here and set across and said, look, when church is over, you can come up and you can have any of these steak dinners. But there's one that's really big, and I'm saving that one. And if you eat it, you will certainly die. And you're like, well, now the only one I want. (laughs) Right? Somebody else would say, well, he said you'd die, but, but would you really die? Like, he's a very forgiving man, and if you took the steak that he told you not to eat of, he probably just wants the biggest one for himself, so go ahead, take it. Right? Do you see what I'm getting at here? You, s- you see the problem? The, the problem is the serpent is only doing one thing, and that is trying to sow a distrust between humanity, Adam and Eve, and God in order so that they would then say, look, what we really want is our freedom. God is so restrictive. He said we couldn't eat from this tree. There were 50 steak dinners up there, but he wouldn't let us eat of the one that looked the best. The biggest. You see, here's the problem. They're both present. Adam is sitting there listening to everything that is being said to Eve, and, and she's the one that maybe takes the first bite and goes, well, here, have some. And he's just going, okay, you didn't die. He also didn't ever say, stop. God said no. God had spoken the truth. He has the one. He's the one that has the authority. He's the one that does it. The serpent, who was also created, was crafty enough to just come in and try to begin to sow the wedge between God and Adam and Eve. Now, you tell me. Anything different today? We may not have a a snake that comes in and goes, Hey, guys! Did God really say, don't go play on the freeway? Man, that could be a lot of fun. You won't die. Go out there. The cars will go around you. They'll stop. You see the problem? The minute that we begin to listen to something other than God... We stop being the image that we were created to be. So what do, when do we find our true vocation? How do we best do that? 
There's so many things I'd love to tell you. Here's the one that really is the most obvious and most important. We best find our true vocation as image bearers when we seek truth and avoid all error. Now, what does that mean? It means that there's only one source for absolute truth. It's God's word. It's God himself. That is the one place you're going to get it. Even if I were to get up here and tell you something, you should be making sure that it it, it rhymes with what God wants you to do. You should be able to read what I'm saying and go, you know what? I think this makes sense. God is speaking a similar thing to me. Look, I know that it would happen if I got up here and said, look, I need all of you to raise individually $1,000 for me personally to help me out. And God said so. It says so right in the Bible. (laughs) See, you're already laughing. You're like, yeah, no. Yeah, not falling for that one, Pastor. Good luck. (laughs) Wonder if there's anybody that's going to be a sucker enough to think God told that. Just make sure you spell my last name right on the check, all right? Here's the deal. You should be checking these things. You should be making sure that you are coming from a place that is the source. And by the way, you should be attending a church that gets its information from the source. I work very hard to try to make sure I'm getting all my information from the source. That's why I would never get up here and go, hey, God says, you need to write me a check. Because it doesn't say that. Error begins and, and can come in any time that we are more concentrated on either somebody who is the, the source giver, the, the one who, who God is going through, and they're trying to teach you a truth, and you're like, I don't know if I emotionally like what they're saying or if I emotionally like that person. So I don't know if I'm even going to bother listening. That begins error. If somebody who you happen to know begins to start to question your faith in ways that make you go, am I right or am I I wrong? You're allowing error in. Go back to the source. Go to God himself. Now, I'm not saying it's not okay to have some questions and, and some things that you need to work through your faith. What I'm saying is pay close attention. You've got to be paying attention to God first and not to the the error that gets entered in. Because the problem is that when sin enters and separates us from God, we simply cannot be good image bearers. We lose all of our ability. You see, we oftentimes are really struggling to decide whether or not we should live into our vocation. As image bearers of God, we start to go, should I really be an image bearer of God? If I'm an image bearer of God, people will begin to make fun of me or they'll think that I'm weak or they'll think that whatever. Or or there's all these reasons why we, we begin to say things. God might call us to do something and, and he might speak to you specifically and say, here's what I want you to do. I want you to do this. And we start to listen to sometimes ourselves We're the ones bringing the error in and going, but I don't like the way this is done or I don't like that or this is going to get in the way or that's just asking too much. And sometimes God is calling us to do something and we go talk to somebody about it and say, I I think God is calling me to do something. And they're like, are you sure? Did God really call you to, to do that ministry or to go into that place? You see, sin enters the world. And what sin essentially does is it begins to separate us from God. And as we get further and further away from God, what begins to happen is that we are no longer reflecting God. We are reflecting kind of a a bad image of God. Where maybe we're good at one thing, but not another. Maybe we've been listening to so many things and not paying attention to what we're actually being told to do. And thankfully, Jesus Christ came into the world to restore the image, to get us back to where we should be, and to make sure that we are more properly reflecting who God is. 
So, I am going to provide each one of you with a device that will show you the image of God. And I have some assistants who are going to pass one out, but I'm going to keep talking as they do. Everybody gets one, and I want you to hold on to it until I tell you how to use it. Okay? So they're getting ready to go ahead and get started. Um, I spared no expense. I just want you to know that right up front. So, if Jesus comes in and he's going to be the one who separates us, it's necessary for us to live absolutely into what God is calling us toward to only pay attention to that which aligns with what God has told us. It's extremely important. It's extremely, absolutely 100% what we need to do. You see, if we are the image bearers of God, we cannot allow anything to get in the way. And I don't know if you know this, but one of the things that most gets in our way is when we listen to ourselves and say, we are not adequate. We are not good enough to be able to do this. So, do you have your device? I want you to put it in your hand. Still a few coming around. I want you to put it in your hand, and I want you to hold it about right here. So go ahead and do that so that it's aimed right at your eyes, okay? I want you to be, you should see your entire face in the device. Otherwise, this doesn't work, all right? You got it? I know there's still a couple more coming around. All right, once you have that, here's the deal. If you see the entire face, you have been made in the image of God. Now, if you are the image of God, and some of you, you have your entire face in there, right? Anybody not have your entire face, you might be using it wrong. We can help you with that. If we have the entire face in there, if God calls you to do it, you are good enough. You are smart enough. You are strong enough. You have all the power you would ever need. You don't need to feel like you are inadequate at all. Now, you've used it. You can put it down, but I want you to hold on to it and keep it and take it with you, and I want you to put it somewhere. I think it has a little sticky on the back if you want to plop it up on something, and I want you to look at it once in a while and remind yourself that you are made in the image of God. And there's nothing that can get in the way, and the only thing that will is when error comes in. But I also want you to think of this mirror in a, ni- in a slightly different way. N.T. Wright refers to something called the angled mirror. The angled mirror, he talks about a time when he was very sick as a young boy. He had to stay in bed, and, and he was feeling very lonely, and his mom needed something to do. So she, she put a mirror in the hallway angled just right so that she could see, he could see out and see them as they walked by and, and did things and whatever else, and they could see him as they walked by, and sometimes they'd wave, and they would know if he was, how he was doing, essentially. And N.T. Wright kind of says, look, this is sort of how this works. We are the angled mirror. That we get what we are supposed to be reflecting from above. God speaks into our life and speaks into who we are and gives us the truth. And then the angled mirror goes out to each other. So that when I see you, do you know what I see? The image of God. You should get more excited about this. Let me ask you a question. Is there anybody that, in, in, I'm, I'm sure they're not in the room, but anybody that really annoys you? Nobody? That's good. Because everybody who's around you has been made in the image of God. Now, there are some people who may not reflect that image well to the people around them or to the world around them. 
But you see how this is supposed to work? So that when I get up here to preach, and this actually is true, it's, it's really exciting for me. Because I get to get up here, and hopefully you see a little bit of God in me, and I get to see a little bit of God in you, and we leave this place, and we're like, yes, let's go, Jesus. Let's go to lunch. And get some God reflected on everybody around us. You are not nearly as excited about this as I am. I'll go out and I'll sit in the heat and I'm going to try to reflect God to everybody that's out there. Amen. Will I be perfect? I don't know. Because there's times when it gets really hot. And there's times when I'm thirsty. And there's times when the water is not as cold as I want it to be. And there's, there, there's times when you, everything you touch is hot. But everybody that walks up to buy fireworks and everybody that I'm there in the room with, images of God. They've been created. It's true whether they're doing it or not. You see, we can only make all of this work if we are connected completely to the truth and avoiding the lies. Hey, that image bearer tester that I gave you, you need to make sure that you recognize that if you see a face in there, that face has been made in the image of God. What are other people seeing? Hmm. You do remember what God says after he creates everything, right? It's good. God created you in his image, and he said, it is good. So don't listen to error. Have you been? Have you been listening to those people who say you aren't good enough, smart enough, good-looking enough, capable enough? Or people that say, you think God can use you? He created you. You are in his image. And if we start to believe all of that, guess what? You might as well crack that mirror a little. Because that's what you see. Or maybe you know some bad you did in the past and, and you look at that mirror and you're like, hmm, there's a little stain over there. And God says, look, I can fix all those cracks. I can clean all the stains. It's why I sent my son to die for you. What's your source for truth? I'll tell you that everything that I told you, it's absolute truth. I don't think it's relative. I think it's absolute. You want to know what I think the biggest fear that I have for us as a, as a people, as a church, is that we're always too busy with our own truth instead of the truth of what God says he did, did and does through us. Heavenly Father, I thank you so much for the privilege it is to have been made in your image, to be your image bearers, the people who, uh, the, the, the creator, cre creation that gets to go out, the creature that goes out in creation and, and is able to, to represent you in everything that we do and everything that we are and everything that we learn and love about. Help us to be good reflections. Help us to be mirror images. When other people see you through us, that's what we really want. When you are able to use us as though we are truly you doing it, that's what we want. So help put away all the error that we see and that we experience and help us to recognize that you created us. You declared us good. And all we need to do is make sure that we stay in constant contact with the source of truth that is you. Lord, we love you. We thank you. We ask that you be with each person as we go throughout this week. Guide us, direct us, keep us strong, and keep us as great, clean reflectors of who you are. In Jesus' name we pray. 